wir schalten jetzt mal komplett um und zwar werden wir uns jetzt über Uran unterhalten, Uranium. Und zwar Lee Courier, CEO und Director von NextGen, wird uns äh, jetzt zugeschaltet sein. Und er führt uns ein bisschen durch die Welt Uran. Äh, wenn Sie uns auf YouTube ein bisschen gefolgt sind, werden Sie gemerkt haben, dass einige unserer Kommentatoren Uran als, äh, als stille Wette im Moment preisen. Oder I was just saying, Lee, just let me switch over to English so you can understand. Uh, you're going to talk about Uranium and uh, If you, if you followed us on YouTube as well, of SF Live, a lot of our guests were highlighting Uranium as uh, as the underdog right now. So really looking forward to that keynote presentation. Uh, we're going to talk mostly Uranium today. We're going to save next gen for tomorrow. Thanks, Kai. <clears throat> And Thanks so uh, hello, hello everyone. And it's, it's awesome to be on today's show. Uh, next Gen Energy, uh, we are delivering the clean energy of the future. We're listed on the New York Stock Exchange and also the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, I will be making forward-looking statements and uh, this presentation will also be available on, on our website. So please take the time to uh, read the, uh, the disclosure. Well, uh, Uranium and for those investors who remember 2004 to 2008, well, you're in for another real treat. Uh, we are approaching these normal commodity cycles and Uranium is no different in terms of uh, experiencing its, its highs and lows. But uh, as everyone's aware or who is familiar with uranium is that uh, typically the, the industry is dominated by 10 year periods of uh, low underinvestment in uh, mine supply. And then once there's a, a supply tremor, uh, the prices do react very, very uh, sharply and for a sustained period of time. And, and we are approaching that uh, moment in the uranium cycle and those who are familiar with 2004 to 2008 when we saw prices go from ten dollars a pound after a 10-year period of of prices under ten dollars a pound well they went up to 140 dollars a pound in the space of four years and the difference uh, between now and back then is that back then there was five top mines in the world who had all had long lives ahead of them those mines are now no longer in production and the state of mine supply is precarious. And we've already seen that with a number of uh, shutdowns of uh, well-established mines. Uh, and uh, you're seeing already the start and the spot price are very, very early though. Uh, so you haven't missed out uh, movements upwards in, in the spot price. And uh, about 18 months ago, it was in the high teens. We've just ticked into $31 a pound. But when you look at the cost of uh, mine supply throughout the globe, you know, the uranium price needs to get well above $50 a pound. Our estimates are above $75 a pound to just keep existing production in a healthy state, let alone incentivize additional production, which the world currently needs. Uh, so very, very exciting moment uh, in the uranium sector uh, as we approach uh, those demand and supply fundamentals. At NextGen, well, we've been busy all the, the past 10 years. We've discovered what is the world's largest, highest grade uh, asset. People talk about tier one assets. Well, uh, our assertion is that NextGen's Arrow project is the one, uh, the leading resource project globally when you look at its uh, um, uh, economic output, but also its elite e uh, environmental ESG profile. Just a couple of the activities that we've We've completed to start the year. We had the conversion of the CEF convertible uh, into equity. That was a $120 million uh, financing facility, which we undertook in 2016 and 2017. And CEF, uh, largest shareholder is Li Kaxing, China's richest individual, uh, well-known uh, 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 investor throughout the globe. And uh, his commitment towards next gen and the upside towards nuclear energy uh, is, uh, is very, very evident. We completed a feasibility study. It uh, highlighted just what an economic powerhouse uh, the Rook One Arrow project is, and also its elite environmental footprint. Uh, financing, we then also raised 172 million in equity, uh, very uh, well supported uh, equity raising at $4.50 a share. We're currently at 5.54, so it's been highly successful. And we're well funded to uh, complete all of our uh, studies, uh, lodgement of our EIS, uh, and also get a really good start on the CapEx uh, component of the uh, Rook One project. 
We've constantly been adding team additions to the project. Recently announced Harpreet Daliwal uh, as our Chief Financial Officer after a very long search. Harpreet's experience is right across uh, mining multiple locations uh, throughout the world and uh, the, uh, the focus on um, accounting efficiency and highly uh, accountable uh, budgeting uh, to actual is, uh, is very, very paramount in her approach. Uh, we are about to release our maiden ESG report. I mentioned before how elite um, uh, the Rook One Arrow project is and everything we've done to date. That's the environmental component of ESG, but also from a social and governance perspective, we're one of the best stories, I think, in the mining sector was, was recognised by the Canadian Prospectors and Developers Association uh, in 2019 for any Canadian company anywhere in the world for deploying an elite community and environmental approach to our activities. Those who have been to the site know that our core processing facility is, is best in class. It's an incredible quality assurance and quality control around all the data that we have on the project that we've collected over the last seven years, but also an incredible learning environment for uh, any uh, technical person who um, uh, comes to our site or, or part of our team. Community agreements. Uh, we are constantly negotiating those agreements. Uh, we have a, uh, we already have agreements in place. These are the agreements that we're currently negotiating are for the project right through to closure. Uh, again, incorporating a real ESG component into the uh, objectives at NextGen. That EIS that I spoke about earlier, the environmental impacts uh, study that is almost completed. It will be uh, completed at the end of this year for filing. And at that stage, the government's going to have everything or the regulators are going to have everything they need both provincially and federally in order to make a, a very well-informed assessment of the Rook One project. And then also on the back of that, our licensing submission as well. Just moving on, green global electrification. Well, it is the number one topic uh, that is facing the, the, the planet. Uh, yes, uh, pandemic, uh, obviously, um, but uh, without the pandemic, uh, clean green electrification is the number one uh, issue of facing, facing the, the planet. The reliability of clean electrification throughout the globe is the single most factor that can improve the quality of living or the average quality of living worldwide. When you consider some parts of the African continent and the Asian continent that uh, less than 5% of the population have power at night, that really does tell you what uh, an impressive goal of clean green electrification can do for the average standard of living, but also in the developed countries as well, where uh, the use of fossil fuels uh, has just got to a point which is really a, a significant issue for the world going forward. And, and so to be part of an industry that's looking to um, solve the number one element right in front of the, the, the planet today is is a, is a privilege, but also very exciting. And, and we look forward to addressing that challenge. And Europe, well, we, we uh, saw that uh, the European uh, Parliament the, or the European Union's science arm officially designated nuclear energy as, as clean, green and safe. And uh, that's going before the European Parliament this summer, uh, looking for immediate ratification of that designation. Now, what that will do is expand the, the uh, pool of available funds into the nuclear sector. And we've seen this before, funds, uh, not just uh, uh, investment funds, but also I would dare say is uh, oil companies, energy companies. And we've seen that in the past in uranium. In the US, back in the early 80s, when the price of uranium uh, uh, at that time was a record high, Oil companies went into the uh, uranium sector. They actually owned a lot of the uranium mines throughout the US, which produced about 304 million pounds at the time. But that tells you those companies are energy companies, be it oil, be it uranium. And now the world's acceptance of uranium or nuclear power as being clean, green and safe. I think you're gonna see some movements in that area as well of oil companies coming into the space, which is incredibly exciting. The US very recently, with their uh, $2 trillion infrastructure spend uh, and also their commitment to the Paris Agreement 
and also having carbon neutrality of their electrical grid by 2035. The energy secretary said it must incorporate nuclear energy. And so I think what you're gonna see there is those plants that were scheduled to uh, close during this decade are going to remain open well into the future. Plus uh, they are talking about providing subsidies to nuclear power uh, along with wind and solar, which will just uh, in, have an incredible effect on the uh, on the demand for uranium and consequently the price of uh, of uranium. So we're we're seeing both Europe's Parliament and the US really uh, addressing climate control uh, climate change and supporting nuclear energy. Yeah, all the wind, solar, all those renewable technologies must be maintained and must be improved. But to meet these targets, the need is far more immediate. We need nuclear power now and in plentiful uh, supply in order to meet these targets. You know, you want to make a real difference? Well, Tesla, everyone's very, very familiar with them. Tesla produces uh, 500,000 cars a day, but only 175 of those 500,000 are truly green and charged uh, by a green power source. Market capitalization of Tesla is just over half a trillion, uh, half a trillion dollars. Whereas the uranium industry fuels reactors globally, which actually removes over 500 million uh, cars off the road every year in T CO2 equivalent. The market capitalization of the uranium industry, and this is the exciting part for investors, is that the mining industry currently has a total market cap of only about 20 billion, less than 4% of Tesla's market cap. Next gen energy alone, once in production, is going to remove over 70 million cars of, of CO2 equivalent every year. So you can, you can get a sense of how excited we are, not just in terms of addressing this need for the, for the planet, but also what the value appreciation of our company is likely to be as we advance into production. Just focusing on a few of the specifics of this uh, exciting industry, the graph on the right-hand side tells you of the impending uh, supply gap that we have on our, on our hands in, this, in the sector. And with a supply gap like that, with demand, growing every year, well, the consequence or the actual outcome of that is only a high uranium price. And uh, as I said before, we are very, very strong in our commitment or our assertion that we believe uranium prices are gonna go well through $50 a pound, upwards of over $75 a pound, probably more likely into the $100 a pound area that we saw before in 2004 to 2008, because production just isn't as stable as what it was back then. Just to give uh, a sense of what we've seen in the past, while well, I mentioned before 2004 to 2008 saw a greater than 2000% increase in the uranium price. And uh, off the back of a 10 year period, you can see there like that uh, price came off in 2010. And we've had this 10 year period of, of underinvestment and we're just about to start that cycle again. And I think we've seen the very early signs of that already in the market. Just for uh, yeah, a lot of people have commented that uh, governments are pumping dollars into the economy and, and inflation is a bit of a fear uh, with respect to uh, those policies. But uh, this is an excellent graph since 2003. It shows that uh, uranium equities uh, is historically outperformed uh, the other commodities during periods of high inflation. And so uh, it's, a, it's a good hedge also uh, from an inflation perspective. Now, just to get to the Elite Arrow project, uh, we, as, an, as, as our uh, company uh, uh, motto is, we are delivering the clean energy of the future. And this project is absolutely incredible. We are low cost and environmentally elite. In terms of that graph on the left-hand side uh, of your page, we're at the lowest end of the cost curve. Now, there are some ISL mines, which individually uh, may be a lower cost per pound, but for a project that's capable of delivering greater than 5 million pounds per annum, we are the lowest on the cost curve. We have a very long life mine. That middle graph there shows the ore body. It's a side view. The uh, vertical extent of the Arrow uranium deposit, it starts 100 metres from surface. It's currently uh, goes down to 920 metres below surface, yet it's open at depth. 
it's open in every direction and we have a very high grade heart of the uh, of the ore body which will uh, account for the first eight years of production and uh, producing around 30 million pounds per annum and jurisdiction wise we're in lo uh, located in Saskatchewan, the number one ranked mining jurisdiction in the world for permitting and developing and operating a uranium mine. So when we talk about tier one, this is why we say when you look at these lowest cost, long life, excellent jurisdiction, environmentally elite, well, out of all the tier one assets, we are the one. And that's right across all commodities. Just some of the, the uh, economics of the project, uh, after tax MPV of $3.47 billion. And now all figures that I'm showing here are based on a $50 a pound uranium price. The payback period is less than 12 months. It's at 0.9 of a year. CapEx 1.3 billion. But with that payback period of being less than a year, the project can accommodate a large proportion of uh, debt finance. So the level of equity between now and positive cash flow when we go into production, the, the percentage of equity that's going to be issued is going to be very immaterial uh, compared to the overall financing package. Uh, it's an extraordinary position to be in, but also shows just how much leverage we're able to accommodate uh, given the phenomenal economics of this project. After tax, I'm talking after tax uh, net cash flow at $1 billion a year. Uh, EBITDA in the order of one and a half billion dollars a year. Now that will take us into the top 15 mining companies worldwide across any commodity or any multi-commodity -com mining company, the top 15. And this is coming from a single asset in the best location in the world with an elite ESG profile. Now our current valuation about two and a half billion uh, uh, going forward with this type of economic profile, the multiples from here are going to be uh, enormous. We've got a 10.7 year mine life as defined by the feasibility study. Now, those that are familiar with that, well, that might be a bit short, but a feasibility study only allows you to look at the measured and indicated resources. We have another 80 million pounds of inferred resources, and I showed you that graph earlier. The project's open in every direction I'll, and we're going to get back to exploration, which I'll, I'll talk to in, uh, in just a moment. But the, we are permitting a mine for over 24 years, which tells you our confidence, not only ours, but the government and the regulatory body's confidence that this is a multi-decade project uh, that we have uh, on our hands here. Uh, just some of the sensitivities uh, of this project uh, uh, incorporating various uranium prices. Well, that, that feasibility study was done on a $50 a pound base case. But, you know, we've highlighted $70 a pound here because, uh, and to, just to give you a sense of the sensitivity, and every $10 in the uranium price basically adds another billion dollars in after-tax MPV at an 8% discount rate. The average contracting price during the last cycle, though, was around $75 US. And I mentioned before, that's why our confidence that the average contracting uh, price in this next cycle is actually going to be a lot higher because mine, the, there's been an increase in the cost of producing uh, uranium worldwide. And so we are very, very confident that the price of uranium is actually going to be a lot higher than $50 a pound. It's actually going to go through uh, and be above uh, $75 a pound uh, into the future and for a long period of time. Uh, just some of the aspects of our of our mine, and look, our surface expression will fit in uh, inside most baseball stadiums, major league baseball stadiums. We have a very very small footprint. These powerful economics are actually going to be coming from one of the world's tiniest underground mines, about thirteen hundred uh, tons per day. That volumetrically is about uh, a double decker bus or two standard buses. Uh, or single story buses uh, in, any, uh, in any major city. A very, very low volume of uh, ore extracted every day. Uh, we've got a very clean processing circuit as well. We have a very, very clean metallurgy with no deleterious metals. So once the ore's at surface, it's a very simple processing circuit. And then once mining is all said and done, we've designed it in a way that uh, in a short period of time post-closure, 
you're going to be hard pressed to know that there was even a mine in the area in the first place. When I talk about elite ESG or elite environmental uh, design, NextGen is the is the leader in that. Uh, I spoke earlier uh, about exploration. We uh, we now that we've got the feasibility study complete and also submission of our EIS, we're about to uh, reinitiate some uh, exploration. And whilst we already have the world's largest, highest grade uranium project, we actually discovered that on the 21st drill hole when we first arrived at the property on a target that hadn't had a drill hole within four kilometers of it. Now, you look, our technical team, very, very good. They've won all the awards and, and, and that's a given. But were we that good that we discovered the world's best project with the very first hole in that area or the 21st hole on the project site? I dare say we weren't. The project or the, the property at Rook One has incredible prospectivity and we've only actually explored less than 10% of the corridor that Arrow currently sits on. And then as we head to the east, we have another nine corridors. I've highlighted the top three there, but we have another nine corridors on our Rook One property that we're yet to explore. We could have 10 drill rigs on this property for 10 years and still not complete the geological va uh, validation of this project. So what I'm saying is we have a very long life asset, as we know, in Arrow, but the likelihood of discovering additional arrows on our Rook One project, I think is very, very self-evident. And uh, it is really the, the number one exploration project in terms of prospectivity that uh, globally, uh, because in the Athabasca Basin, you know, you're dealing with deposits that are 100 times the, the world's average grade of, of production. So. Uh, an incredible geological setting. Next gen hosts what is the most uh, predominant uh, exploration package in the southwestern side of the basin as well, uh, which complements the Arrow project uh, beautifully. Sustainability, it's an absolute pillar of what we're doing. Uh, we have uh, some of our local community uh, programs that we've done, uh, our education of uh, students coming out to site. We have six on post secondary. Uh, scholarships that have uh, been funded by uh, NextGen Health and Wellness, uh, our breakfast club, we're well known for it. There's a picture there of the Premier, the local mayor and the former mayor of Laloche and myself at the NextGen Breakfast Club. And uh, Justin Trudeau uh, uh, also uh, has acknowledged the great work that NextGen is doing uh, up in the, uh, the local project area. And we've also been building economic capacity since we, uh, since our very first drill hole, now there's a number of businesses that have been set up that are servicing other businesses in the local project area. And that's something that the whole team at NextGen here is very, very proud of. Just with respect to the capital structure, we have 471 million shares issued, uh, 500 million fully diluted, uh, 213 million Canadian in the bank, which funds us well into that 1.3 billion CapEx, we've got some pre-commitment early works such as uh, surface clearing and airstrip that uh, we're going to uh, start uh, in, in 2022 after submission of the EIS. Uh, all that exploration, we're well funded for that as well. Some of our uh, uh, shareholdings uh, or, or shareholders, CEF I mentioned before, Lee Kashing out of Hong Kong, Queens Road Capital, uh, it, a partner of CEF Holdings, who was set up to help facilitate a number of Australian mining billionaires to uh, invest in the resources space. One of which is Andrew Forrest, the founder of the Fortescue Metals Group, a, a $65 billion iron ore producer. He's a, he's a big fan of uh, next gen and, and what we're doing in the uranium space, but also our approach to ESG. Mega Uranium, a founding shareholder led by Richard Patricio, well experienced in the uranium mining sector. Uh, were, had and also experienced back in the, the, the 2004 and 2008 uh, uh, uranium industry. Copernic, Segra, CQS, Falcon, Old West, uh, Janice Hans, Henderson, Session Co. Really, uh, th those ones are, are very familiar, well experienced in uranium investing. And it really is, from that perspective, the who's who uh, of uranium investing are, are very strong supporters of next gen. 
and the manner in which we're uh, optimizing this project. So with that, Kai, I'll uh, hand it over to any uh, questions that you may have. For sure. Thanks so much, Lee. Thanks for running us through this. Really insightful. And uh, I do have to say, I do have some question about the supply side of uranium. That's for me, not as transparent. I was hoping it to be, and I, I regard myself as a retail investor in this space. I'm not too sophisticated when it comes to uranium. So to clear that up for us. Like, where's the supply coming from right now? And of course, there's a lot of overground supply from old nuclear reactors, for example, in Japan. Right. So I'm, I'm, my, my question is leading towards like, where is the trigger now for higher uranium prices? And that's what I'm trying to look for. Right. Yeah. Yep. So we'll just demands very steady, grows at one point to two percent per annum. On the supply side, there is always this talk of uh, at surface supplies. But the key factor there is, is it actually available in terms of uh, accessible or could it come back onto the market? And we've, we've not seen that. For, for 20 years. The, back in 2004 to 2008, there were, when the price went from $10 a pound up to $140 a pound, there was actually greater at surface supplies uh, that were, were on surface. Um, but what we've seen from a mine supply perspective, we're seeing a real shift from Western world production to say uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, a good example of this is that uh, the US used to import about 8% of their um, nuclear fuel from uh, Russia and Russian uh, like uh, states. That figure in 2019 went up to 44%. So there's been a shift in the supply of uranium from uh, Western world, say Canada, Australia, uh, and the US to uh, Kazakhstan. And so there's been a bit of a, well, I'll say, a, a, a bit of a, a real shift and imbalance, so to speak, from the traditional mine supply that the US, the world's largest market, and they will be the largest market even well into the 2030s, even though there's a very strong uh, growth forecast out of China. But for a country that consumes 50 million pounds per annum, and yet they produce less than one, yeah, they, it, it, it's a very interesting uh, perspective that we have here, uh, unprecedented in fact. And so uh, Kazakhstan have done a really good job in f filling the gap, but the world needs more balanced supply from more sources. And what, what I believe you're going to see is particularly in the Athabasca Basin area uh, of Canada, uh, all of the projects ourselves, um, fission, Denison, et cetera, are all going to uh, need to get into production to help provide a bit, bit of a more balanced uh, mine supply situation. Yeah, and uh, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. I'm gonna save my other questions for tomorrow because you will be back tomorrow uh, for a brief presentation as well. Uh, one of the question is, are you planning to adjust your CapEx and IRR figures due to commodity price increases over the coming years? Yeah, no, we're not. Uh, the, uh, we'll be building the plant irrespective of the uh, uranium price at any particular time. Now, we're extremely confident that it's going to be significantly higher than where we are today as we go into production. But when you've got the world's lowest um, cost uh, asset, our, our project's going to be in production in any uranium pricing uh, cycle. And even at uh, you know, the most historically low uranium prices, there's still a phenomenal economic return coming from this project. Lee, we have to switch gears again. We have to go back to gold. Um, there's one more question in the chat I'd like you to answer, actually, to, so I don't forget to ask it tomorrow. Uh, it's an interesting one because it talks about you, uh, oil companies entering the uranium sector, and you've seen that happening before, or happening. So really yeah. appreciate your, your insights, Lee. Uh, looking forward to catching up tomorrow again. Thanks, Guy. Cheers. Thanks, Lee. Take care.